is, uh, this is one of the fun parts of the uh, Innovation Summit. We started doing this a few years ago, and uh, we uh, this year we, uh, with the uh, support of uh, Connecticut Innovations, our, our, our platinum sponsor, we've been able to um, elevate the prizes up to $10,000 for first prize and $5,000 for second prize and $2,500 for third prize. So, um, so we're happy to uh, um, get to five digits on the prizes. And, uh, but it's a great pleasure um, to introduce Rob Bettigal. Rob's been helping with this for a few years now. Um, uh, Rob is uh, uh, managing partner at uh, Elm Street Ventures. Uh, which has been um, for over a decade now a great partner of Yale's, um, helping spin out uh, quite a number of uh, companies, uh, a lot of biotech companies, but some other stuff too. And um, so thank you, Rob, for your, your support, uh, uh, your sponsorship of the summit, and for uh, helping us uh, run this contest today. Rob Bettigal. Thanks, Bill. First, I just want to, I want to thank Bill uh, and uh, John Soderstrom uh, and Tim Obstrup for uh, uh, their work and the, and the work of their staff in putting this together. It's uh, just phenomenal to see how this uh, conference has grown over the last few years. So let me give you the ground rules first. Uh, we'll have uh, eight, eight speakers. Uh, they'll have five minutes each for their pitch. They'll get a signal from Colin. He's going to wave a red shirt in his hands with one minute left. Um, and then there'll be two minutes for questions. Uh, the questions will probably be just, uh, just from the judging panel because uh, we won't have very much time. So without further ado, I'd like to call up our first speaker, Chukri Ben Mamon. I'd like to point out that in, his, um, in the program, it refers to their cure for infection infections, but instead it's for fungal infections. <laughs> Good. How do we go back? All right. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Shukri Balnamun. I'm professor of medicine and infectious disease at Yale. I'm also the founder of Eli V5 Therapeutics. And the mission of this company is to develop a breakthrough therapy in the fungal, antifungal space. Our goal is to develop drugs that are highly potent against drug sensitive and drug resistant pathogens, but are safe and it can achieve radical cure. The team consists of three biologists, one medicinal chemist, and one clinician from Yale New Haven Hospital who will help us advance these compounds to clinical trials. Annually, fungal infections are responsible for 1.5 million deaths globally and 97,000 deaths in the United States with 90% of these infections caused by Canada and aspergillus species. The areas of the world that are dominated by these infections are uh, Asia, North America and Europe. The market in 2018 was 12, uh, over $12 billion. This market is supposed to grow to $19.3 billion by 2023, with two classes of drugs, azoles and echinocandines, accounting for 75% of the market, which is commercialized by a series of large pharmaceutical companies as well as specialized companies. However, despite these therapies, the mortality rates associated with fungal infections can be very high, as high as 95% in the case of aspergillosis, and as high as 75% in the case of candidiasis. And this is primarily due to the rise in, of drug-resistant pathogens, including naturally occurring drug, multi-drug resistant pathogens, such as Candida auris, which was featured last month in the New York Times. So the solution offered by Eli V5 Therapeutics is a novel metabolic pathway that was discovered in my lab, for the synthesis of coenzyme A, which controls 10% of all cellular activities in the cell. This pathway is essential for the viability of all fungal pathogens, and we focus primarily on the first step in this pathway, catalyzed by the pentatomate kinase. We cloned the fungal pathogen enzyme from, multi the enzyme from multiple fungal pathogens, we purified the enzymes, uh, optimized the, the assay and screened a library of 131,000 compounds and completed another screen of 25,000 compounds. From the initial screen, we identified 25 hits, tested 50 analogs of these hits, and identified several actives representing three chemical classes and three singletons that have never been developed before as antimicrobials. 
The properties of these compounds tested so far are they're highly selective and show excellent safety profile as shown here. The enzyme, the fungal enzyme is in red. We see inhibition by the drugs. The human enzyme is in black. We see absolutely no inhibition. Here I represented the three chemotypes with highly selective indices with the aspergillus enzymes inhibited in the nanomolar to low micromolar range, no inhibition of the human enzyme, and no toxicity in HeLa cells. Finally, we filed a provisional patent to protect these compounds with Yale University. Another unique feature of this, of this uh, compound uh, is that our pathway, or our target, sits upstream of the ergosterol biosynthesis pathway, which is the target of the majority of antifungal drugs currently in the market. As a result, our compounds can on, not only serve as monotherapies, but they could also be combined with current therapies to, to create highly synergistic combina combination therapy that can achieve radical cure. This is demonstrated in the lab using both genetics and pharmacological studies. If you have an active pentotonate kinase, you get 40% inhibition with amphotericin B. However, if you inhibit the enzyme in vivo with the, to 8% activity, you get 100% inhibition. And this is an isobologram showing inhibition with amphotericin B when combined with, with alpha panam, and you see highly synergistic combination. So we are highly confident that, com that inhibitors of the pantothenate kinase can be combined with amphotericin B to create the first highly synergistic combination in the treatment of antifungal, for fungal infections and potentially achieve radical cure. So we are currently funded by the program Innovative Therapeutics for Connecticut Health, and we are raising $1.8 million dollars to do drug optimization, perform in vitro efficacy studies against multiple fungal pathogens, do pharmacological studies, and test these compounds in vivo using different mouse models of fungal infections. The uh, goal of this project is to identify clinical candidates that can enter phase one clinical trials. In summary, Eli V5 Therapeutics has novel inhibitors, a novel mode of action, and a novel strategy that can achieve radical cure, and we are in a competitive advantage state with our IP lasting as to 2039. We are asking for $1.8 million with the milestone which is to identify clinical candidates and the goal to achieve a therapy that can achieve radical cure. Thank you very much. much for staying on time and a, a nice crisp presentation. Questions from the judges? I've got a question. So um, you, you cite the level of mortality with these fungal infections, which is obviously true. Um, part of the reason is the drugs don't work, and the other part of the re reason is you get drug-drug uh, interactions. So right. how do you, I mean, it's obviously too early for you to, to be looking right. at DDIs, but how are you thinking about that, and why do you think you're going to, with oral drugs, be able to get to some of the systemic lung infections which are causing the mortality? Right, so this is something that we are, we are very aware of, and we plan to test in vivo when we, when we get into the animal models. We have several models initially focusing primarily on uh, candidiasis and aspergillosis, but this is certainly something that we are aware of, especially in the case of toxicity, liver, et cetera, that we will certainly address as we move forward. Another question from, from the judging panel. Question from the audience. We have a minute and seven seconds. <laughs> All right. Shukri, thank you very much. Thank you. Next up for us is uh, Eric Song. He'll be speaking about uh, their treatment uh, for brain cancer. Specifically on this growth factor VEGFC, uh, and we show that VEGFC delivery can recruit more immune cells into the brain, amplify neuroimmune responses, and then potentiate current cancer immunotherapies to eradicate tumors. So our team consists of Dr. Akiko Yosaki, a professor of immunology here at Yale, and I'm an MD-PhD student in our lab. So one of the most famous growth factors in tumor biology is this growth factor VEGFA. VEGFA is known to be an uh, angiogenic molecule. Um, it signals through VEGFA receptor 2, and there's even a therapy against it, an anti-VEGFA antibody, bevacizumab, which is approved for GBM therapy. But less is known about its counterpart, VEGFC. 
uh, VEGFC is primarily lymphangiogenic. Um, it signals through a different receptor, VEGFR3, and it's not a target of bevacizumab therapy. So our idea was that um, in, in an organ that's primarily uh, deficient in immune responses, we can increase the immune responses by delivering this molecule. Um, and for GBM, which has a very poor prognosis and lack of responses after PD-1 treatment, we can increase its immunogenicity by delivering VEGFC, increasing the lymphatic drainage, um, increasing the immune infiltrate, and potentiate current immunotherapies. So VEGFC is an exciting molecule to work with because it can be delivered in many different ways. Um, we use protein and NAV, although these have some limitations to delivery methods. So we developed the mRNA VEGFC delivery method, uh, which can encompass all, all the limitations. Um, the protein expression kinetics can be effective and easily measured, um, and it can be localized into delivery by intrathecal injections, mitigating any possible side effects. And we see here, after a single administration of VEGFC, we can see significant proliferation of the lymphatic vasculature associated with the brain. And this is quantified here. So using VEGFC as a, a therapeutic modality, we first delivered it as a monotherapy or a combination therapy with PD-1. Um, you can see as a monotherapy um, shown in green or a monotherapy of PD-1 shown in yellow, it has limited effect in eradicating tumors. But as a combination therapy, we see significant eradication of the tumor and long-term survivors. We believe this is happening because VEGFC is able to recruit the immune cells. And then, as shown here, we see increase in the number of T cells infiltrating the brain. And then PD-1 therapy then can activate these immune cells to eradicate the tumors. Um, here, we also see that the T cells that are coming into the brain are more polyfunctional, meaning they can provide different uh, cytokines to actually have good effectiveness against the tumor. So there are approved therapies for GBM, uh, very limited, um, but these don't cross off all the barriers that are present in GBM. Um, and you can see, even as a, a preclinical model, in animal models, there's limited benefit um, using these as a monotherapy. PD-1 therapy, which has gained a lot of traction for other therapies um, or other tumors, are not really working for patients in clinical trials. And even as a monotherapy in animal models, doesn't work very well. And we show that in combination, we can significantly boost the immune responses against the GBM. Um, and because this is an immune response, if we re-challenge mice that eradicated the tumor once, uh, they form a long-term memory immune response against the tumor, um, shown here. So, so far, we've done mechanistic studies to understand how VEGFC is working. Um, we filed a provisional patent on um, the method of causing lymphangiogenesis um, in brain tumor models or in brain tumors, and also uh, file a, a provisional patent trying to encompass the material of mRNA VEGFC therapy. Um, we're continuing to do further studies to evaluate what VEGFC um, is doing and if it has any toxicities or other uses. Um, and this has gained a lot of uh, excitement in our uh, community, and the Yale Neurology Department is very interested in starting a phase one trial. So our current bottleneck is trying to produce GMP quality material um, for phase one clinical trials. And in conjunction, we're also working with other members of the Yale community to develop a higher potency VEGFC through phage display systems. So brain tumors are a horrible, horrible disease, leaving patients and families with a devastating uh, outcome. And we think with your help, we can bring hope to these patients. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, nice talk. Um, I wanted to come back to safety, I guess, for a second. Um, yes. So, you know, concerns um, with uh, increasing lymphangiogenesis in terms of brain edema, um, evidence that there'll be a challenge with the infiltration of immune cells. Um, right. So at least in like steady state, uh, just healthy animals, we don't see any increases in immune cell infiltration because there's no cognitive antigen that's bringing the immune cells back into the brain. Um, also, um, as far as edema goes, um, it would, increasing the lymphatic drainage would help with any sort of edema. So um, this might be an additional benefit that, because um, usually brain tumor patients get steroids to help with the edema, but this might actually help with that in addition. Yeah, can, can you talk about uh, your approach in terms of IP? Yeah, so in IP, um, so our, we filed a provisional patent, um, and then 
it's on the method of um, inducing lymphangiogenesis um, in brain for the evaluation of tumor. And then also um, the use of VEGFC in an mRNA formulation has never been used. So that's one thing we're pushing. And then also we're working with now uh, a protein engineer to develop novel isoforms of VEGFC in order to make it more stronger, yeah. And can you talk a little bit about dosing and intrathecal delivery? Yeah. How, how you envisage that? Yeah, so for intrathecal delivery, I, I deliver it in the mice, in the CSF, um, in the back of the neck. Um, in human translation aspect, uh, the neurosurgeons and the neurologists are very okay with this because ports for GBM therapy uh, have also been approved already. So you can just install a port when you do the resection of the initial tumor uh, and deliver therapeutics that way. Um, as far as dosaging, um, I mean, I've done different dosaging in mice. I don't know how it correlates to human exactly, um, but one promising thing is that it can, there is a potential for it to cross-react the blood-brain barrier, but in order to get to that therapeutic dosage, I would have to administer about 1,000 times more than what I'm delivering currently. Um, so I think any worries about unwanted side effects is minimal. Great, thanks so much, Eric. Thanks. Great. Great time. Sean Bickerton is going to speak about Statera Therapeutics, and Philip also, Philip Kong also. Um, and they're talking about their um, spatio-temporally uh, tuned nanoparticles for immunotherapy delivery. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Bickerton, and we are two of the co-founders at Statera Therapeutics. At Cetera, we're led by a young and determined team, but we've also worked hard to surround ourselves with a core group of advisors that includes uh, world-leading authorities in engineering, immunobiology, and entrepreneurship. Autoimmune disease presents a huge burden to human health. Uh, if we take one example, multiple sclerosis affects over a million patients in the US alone, with healthcare costs totaling over $23 billion a year. Despite this, patients are currently forced to accept chronic symptom management at the, as the standard of care, and at Cetera, we're striving to improve this. There's a promising field of treatment called antigen-specific therapy with the potential to retrain patient immune responses, effectively addressing the underlying cause of disease. However, to date, no antigen-specific therapy has successfully made it through clinical trial. One of the most promising ways to achieve antigen-specific therapy is to induce tolerogenic antigen-presenting cells. When effectively induced, these cells can go on to reestablish immune response balance towards antigens that are implicated in a patient's disease. And an effective way to achieve these cells is through the use of nanoparticles that can selectively co-deliver antigen and immunosuppressant to APCs in the patient body. However, an often overlooked aspect of this strategy is that effective immune skewing of APCs to a tolerogenic phenotype is dependent on the time and the location at which it occurs. Notably, it's most effective when APCs reside in the patient's periphery in an immature state prior to antigen exposure, maturation, and migration to the surrounding lymph nodes. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, <laughs> For the past, uh, and notably, currently existing nanoparticles do not take those factors into account. So for the past four years, Cetera has worked to develop our spatio-temporally tuned particles, or STPs. In addition to getting to the right cells, our STPs afford something new. They afford distinct release kinetics of the two components included that are very, very different from nanoparticle systems that currently exist. And importantly, the sequential delivery of immunomodulator prior to antigen release affords early transition of these APCs towards a tolerogenic phenotype and more uh, accurately fits with the optimal temporal criteria I outlined in the slide previous. Thank you, Sean. So having developed this platform, <laughs> we saw a selective a scientific validation saw a selective expansion of regulatory T cells, which are subsets of cells that are important for restoring homeostasis in an autoimmune state. In the meanwhile, we didn't see any expansion of other inflammatory cells, such as TH2s, TH17s, and NK cells. Having seen selective expansion of Tregs, we decided to evaluate the efficacy of our platform in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. 
our platform, sh shown here in pink, was compared against the control, which means no treatment, compared against standard, which is a conventional PLG nanoparticle platform that delivers the same antigen and the same immunomodulator as our system. In the prevention model, we see that our platform completely prevents the onset of disease. And in the therapeutic treatment, where mice are injected with nanoparticles at the peak of disease, we see that our platform has greatly reduced the disease se severity compared to the standard and the control. Now, in thinking about our competitors, we realize that there are some companies out there that have just started to realize the potential of combining nanoparticle delivery and antigen-specific therapy. However, no company currently has a platform that can also, that fully considers the spatial temporal parameters as well, putting us ahead of the game. So to take the next step, we need to translate our platform into a clinical product. In order to do so, we need to replace our murine antigen to an antigen that is more relevant to, more clinically more relevant to the human disease. Consistent with this idea of using pre-FDA approved materials to build our platform, we came up with three distinct approaches. First, we identified an off, we identified a shelf drug that, was, that showed a lot of promise in clinical trials, up until phase three. By encapsulating this product into our platform and by increasing the efficacy, we believe that this can take us to the promised land. Second, we would like to encapsulate a generic target into our platform and demonstrate the efficacy there. We would also like to partner with a biopharmaceutical company to test their experimental antigen. Currently, we're looking for seed money of $1.5 million in order to cover human capital, manpower, and R&D. We would also like to recruit experienced biotech professionals to join our leadership team. Thank you. We'll take any questions. So, Sean, good work. Questions? Can you uh, speak a little bit to IP? Yeah, so it would seem like it's going to be pretty critical sort of how your particles are differentiated. Yeah, so uh, uh, the creation and utility uh, of our material, these STPs, is defensible by a Yale protected patent, which is currently provisional, but is due for conversion um, in the next couple days. Uh, and yeah. yeah. And uh, sorry, maybe just to follow up, um, do you anticipate repeat dosing of your particles um, in yes. the disease context? So in animal models, it's not required. But obviously, uh, animals are not humans. Uh, and so in order to determine an effective dose in humans, optimally, we'd like to find a dose that works to reestablish immune homeostasis. And that should be a self-propagating thing in terms of you generate a tolerogenic response. You generate a sufficient population of regulatory cells, which then feed into um, a baseline or reset the baseline, reset the steady state. But to be honest, we don't know the answer to that question until we try. Yeah. I would also like to add that compared to other companies that have published papers on their studies using a similar model, we were able to achieve the same efficacy because of our engineer spatial temporal parameters that we were able to achieve the same effect by using 10 times less of those. Cindy, you had a question? I actually, it's an IP question. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Um, what would be your go-to-market strategy in terms of which indication would you pick first? So um, one of the things we have been talking about with that core advisor group, and we have some pretty fantastic people on there, including people that are experts in multiple sclerosis and in immunobiology. But one thing that came up was if this is an effective strategy, one patient cohort that might benefit the most are uh, multiple sclerosis patients with radiographically isolated symptoms. And so these are patients prior to the progression to the point where they're showing some neurological manifestations of disease. They have been identified as high risk and actually having MS through uh, incidental findings on um, imaging. And so this kind of falls in between prophylactic and prevention because it's not truly prophylactic. They already have disease, but you're preventing the progression to the point where um, they are now <coughs> displaying symptoms of their disease. And so that might be an interesting patient cohort to, to test initially the system. Great. Through. Thank you, Sean. Thank you both. Thank you. So 
One of, one of the great pleasures in, in, in the work that we do at Elm Street Ventures is uh, meeting uh, uh, really, really committed, passionate entrepreneurs. You're seeing a bunch of them today. But um, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with uh, John off and on for a number of years now and determined and, and so great to see the progress he's made with systolics. <clears throat> Cytosolox. Mm -hmm. Almost there. <laughs> Green button. They're waiting for me to pronounce your company name correctly. Sure thing. Cytosolix. And we're here. Yeah. Oh, now we're here. All right, thanks. So at Cytosolix, we aim to revolutionize drug design and oncology. With just a small change, we can target 90% of oncology drugs to 95% of cancers, making therapy safer and more effective by targeting a universal biomarker of solid tumors, acidity. I invented my technology here at Yale uh, and have since recruited a world-class advisory board consisting of former pharma CEOs, heads of R&D, oncology, clinical, and regulatory. The problem we're addressing is that despite decades of improvements, cancer therapies still largely fail and harm most patients. Uh, and this is because these drugs share the same limitation. They're meant to harm human cells, so they cause damage whenever they get into healthy tissues. But remarkably, 38% of approved drugs today selectively target healthy tissues in the body because of a consequence of tumor acidity on weak bases incorporating these drugs for solubility. This is promoting the very side effects that are limiting the effectiveness of therapy. So the current Paradigm in oncology ignores, uh, ignores tumor acidity and is therefore promoting these toxicities that are undermining patient outcomes. But while traditional therapies suffer from tumor acidity, we embrace it as a biomarker for selective delivery to tumors. We control cell uptake, recognizing that only the neutral form of drug will get into a cell. So wherever a weak ion is present in this drug, the pH of the tissue will influence its charge and therefore where it accumulates in the body, such that weak bases will tend to accumulate in healthy tissues, while weak acids will tend to accumulate in tumors. So we designed a small library of weakly acidic groups that are tuned to discriminate between these two pH environments. And we deploy those in a uh, patent pending platform we call tumor activated permeability or TAP therapy where we're replacing weekly basic variable groups in drugs with our weekly acidic TAP groups producing novel tumor targeted derivatives with fresh and typically exclusive IP. We can replace these weekly basic groups in drugs because they lie at solvent exposed regions that do not impact the binding of the target. Our TAP groups can impart over 100-fold selectivity, and when we're replacing detrimental weak bases, that can mean over a 1,000-fold improvement on the parent drug. So we've applied this strategy to numerous drugs to date with similar outcomes. For example, here we have osimertinib, leading kinase inhibitor in non-small cell lung cancer. We replace its weekly basic amine with our TAP group, a small change that makes a big difference changing a drug that is sevenfold more toxic to cells treated at healthy pH than at tumor pH into a TAP derivative that is 17 times more toxic by IC50 at tumor pH than healthy pH, improving that drug by over 100-fold. We see similar results with our pro-drugs in doxorubicin, where we are improving a drug that's 15 times more toxic at healthy pH into one that is 12 times more potent at tumor pH. This is by a ratio of the IC50 values we've measured. So our platform can deliver more drug to tumors, reaching greater efficacy. We can get first-in-class approvals by overcoming the limitations that are, have drugs stuck in the clinic. And we can enable new and more effective combinations by taking away the overlapping shared toxicities that prevent these therapies. We can deliver 90% of drugs to 95% of cancers, allowing us to raise the whole landscape of <coughs> oncology drugs today. And that lets us address a total addressable market of over $50 billion. And we can take a leading position in that space because we are standing alone as the only orally bioavailable platform for targeting drugs selectively to tumors. So with broad opportunities, we have plenty of chances for drug development at Cytosolics. And we have evaluated every one. 
Uh, we exclude things that are incompatible by chemistry or that target blood cancers selectively and identify 52 targets in the cancer cell. We've prioritized these by market opportunity and value proposition, and we select a subset of these for our internal pipeline opportunities, which have facile clinical development paths so we can get rapid and inexpensive approvals at a small startup company. From that subset, we'll be selecting our initial pipeline priorities, and we can address the huge landscape of what else we can improve through a broad external pipeline of partnerships with pharma. So we've established now a uh, drug development strategy for this that it takes into account our pH dependent activity. It takes about 100K and six months through in vitro proof of concept, and then a total of nine to 12 months and 250K through in vivo proof of concept. So we'll be raising about three million in seed funds to get our proof of concept work done and get a strong IP position to go out and talk with pharma. And then once we have clinical candidates elected, we will be uh, raising a $30 million Series A to drive our first targets to the clinic. So at Cytosolix, we see a way to revolutionize drug design and oncology because we've recognized that a small change can make a big difference. Thank you. Great, John. Questions from the judges? Yeah, how do you um, consider, uh, envisage your um, business model? Are you going to develop yourself your drugs or are you going to partner everything or how do you see that? Yeah, so we will be focusing a very laser focused internal pipeline on what we see as our top uh, value prop opportunities uh, in things that we can take all the way through phase two. Um, and then in parallel, we'll have an external pipeline where we have our in vitro proof of concept to enable us to secure IP and go out for par pharma partnerships. That's where we're going to get the broader landscape. Uh, we capture a larger value when we develop from start to finish in-house. And because we're doing just lead development, we're starting with existing drugs. We don't have to find new ways to kill cancer cells. Um, it's an easy process to make these changes, identifying through structurated drug design where we can vary drugs effectively. And? Can you tell us about any concern of hitting other metabolically active tissues? Sure. So acidity is really a unique opportunity in the body. The other places where acidity lives in the body are outside of places that are exposed to blood. So you have your stomach. It acidifies, but that's luminal to the stomach. You have the surface of your skin. Again, that's outside of the blood exposure. And then you have the filtrate uh, that becomes urine. That acidifies. So all of these are outside of blood exposure. Uniquely in the body, uh, acidity is a, a feature of cancer. Inflammation causes a light acidity only down to about pH 6.8. Um, tumors get as low as about pH 6. Another qu quick question. Um, any evidence that the TAPs um, have any detrimental effects in terms of changing the clearance profiles of compounds or PK or things like that? Sure. So. The, the way we're doing this is intending to keep drugs out of healthy tissues. Traditional drug design uses the whole body as a reservoir to achieve a really easy PK profile. But every tissue that drug goes into produces a liability for toxicity. We believe it's worth the time and effort to follow a rigorous pharmacology development profile um, and get drugs exposed evenly to tumors uh, with the, the approaches that we've established in drug development. Now, for us, we have to solve that problem early because we have to be able to compare that in our proof of concept work. So we have established a rigorous pharmacology development profile in our proof of concept strategy to overcome that. In terms of toxicity, um, glucuronidation is the only thing we're keeping our eye on, and we have 30 different types of TAP groups. So if one has a liability, we can leave that behind without losing the platform. Great. Thanks, John. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> Next up is uh, Natalie Ma um, speaking about uh, transforming therapeutics and biomaterials with synthetic biology. Thank you, Rob. And I'd like to thank Farron for uh, allowing me to present today. I'm excited to present to you Pearl Bio which is our synthetic biology company that's designing novel biomaterials for applications in therapeutics and medicine. Green button. Oh, thank you. 
So quick note before we get started, I'm Natalie Ma. I was a PhD in Farron's lab. I joined a consulting firm after I left and am now heading up business development at Pearl Bio. Our team has world-class commercialization expertise with over 40 years of experience. We also have deep scientific expertise. Farron and Mike are both leading synthetic biologists in their fields. Overall, we also have a long history of collaboration. I came from Farron's lab, and Farron and Mike have been collaborating for over 10 years, which has led to a panoply of synthetic biology technologies that comprise Pearl Bio's core company platform. Of note, this includes the ability to incorporate new chemistries into proteins in vivo, not only in vitro, through the genomically recorded organisms and orthogonal tethered ribosomes, both of which are proprietary to our company. Overall, our technologies combined enable us to design, optimize, and bioproduce biomaterials at commercially relevant levels of greater than one gram per liter. The first problem we want to tackle with this technology is the ability to tune half-life in therapeutics. This remains a key unmet need. If you can't tune the half-life of a therapy, you can't modulate how long it hangs around in the body, and it may not work as a therapeutic, or you may be able to design a therapeutic, but it has very burdensome dosing. Patients getting weekly IVs that last two hours or more, or they're getting daily injections. So in order to harness the power of protein-based therapeutics, we really require new methods to tune half-life, as well as endow other new functions. So here's what our platform can do. We're able to incorporate unnatural amino acids into proteins, here represented in, by red circles, that then act as attachment sites for fatty acids. These then modulate the half-life of a protein in the body. And what we show with our data are that the increase in number of fatty acids we can incorporate, which could be one, which is the current state of the art, to two, five, 10, or even 30 or 40 of these fatty acids, increase the half-life of the therapeutic, but also incorporating five or 10 fatty acids, as shown here in blue and green, increases half-life by 750% and 2,500% compared to the state-of-the-art single fatty acid. So this is a dramatic increase, and the only one application of our technology. You could envision adding modifiers that enable targeting to specific cellular compartments or crossing the blood-brain barrier. Our initial indication for this application will be in obesity more broadly, with a specific initial proof of concept in the rare disease prater willi syndrome, disease with no therapies for obesity and high burden. The broader play in the obesity market will likely be a partnership with a larger pharmaceutical company to enable the, the complex clinical trials. However, we're not married to this indication yet, and as mentioned, we have many potential indications. We could, we're also looking into rare enzyme deficiency diseases, such as Gaucher and Hunter, where their therapies have truly been dramatically hindered by half-life. Overall, Pearl Bio is also uniquely positioned within the synthetic biology space. So other companies have made great strides in trying to bring therapies to market containing unnatural amino acids. However, they are usually are incorporating only one or two of these amino acids into the overall protein. We are able to not only incorporate multiple instances of these amino acids, but also incorporate two or more different types enabling new chemistries. And in addition, not only do this in vitro, but also in vivo, as well as incorporate new non-amino acid-based monomers that enable much more of the chemical repertoire. And potential applications of this include everything from multifunctionalized antibodies to programmable peptide therapeutics to biocontained living therapies. And all of this are protected by a strong IP foundation comprising 12 active patent cases. So going forward, we will build on our capability to add new chemistries to proteins to enhance therapeutics, uniting the precision of biology and the diversity of chemistry to create biomaterials that are template-directed chemically diverse, and precisely tunable. In parallel, we will pursue development of our therapeutic agents through proof of concept preclinical work, followed by IND enabling preclinical trials and clinical trials. In summary, ProBio is uniquely positioned to, to uh, harness synthetic biology to develop novel biomaterials that were previously thought impossible. And with that, I thank you for your time and will happily take any questions. Thanks, Natalie.
Questions from the judges. I'm puzzled between the product and the platform. I feel that you have some uh, knowledge and you will be playing in the synthetic biology, but can you elaborate on the, your first product? Yeah, of course. So in terms of the first product, we're looking at the application of like, obesity and pre related syndrome specifically, as I mentioned. We have a couple of therapeutic targets there, and part of the reason we're going after that space, despite it being a challenging one commercially, is because there have been prior agents in that space that have been modified with that single fatty acid that are now billion dollar drugs and have shown effect in obesity. However, they're specifically for diabetes. Another question. Can you um, talk a little bit more about your IP? Because as you put up on your chart, there are other companies um, incorporating non-natural amino acids and adding fatty acids and lipids to extend half-life, again, is widely done. Got it, yeah. So in terms of our IP, our capability is really the ability to incorporate this in multiple instances. So when we think about the other companies in the space, they can add one or two of these amino acids that allow linkers. But what we're able to do is add five, 10, or more. So that, as shown in the data, dramatically increases the half-life in this case. But if you're able to add linkers or attachments that create other modifications, such as targeting, you could envision that those would also create therapeutics with greater efficiency or efficacy. So then for your Prater Willi drug, the plan is mm -hmm. to extend the half-life or also to make it better by modifying it in some way? Yes, there are no approved therapeutics in obesity for Prater Willi syndrome yet. We have a couple of potential targets that we think are functional within Prater Willi syndrome and also have broader application in obesity as a whole. So the goal would be to engineer a novel therapeutic in that space with the tuned half-life that we could then take to the broader obesity market. However, as I mentioned, we do have other potential therapeutic areas in mind, particularly those rare enzyme deficiency diseases, where there are existing therapeutics that we could do more of an ROA play on. Great. Thanks so much, Natalie. Great. Thank you. Great job. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeffrey Bender, Target Site Therapeutics. He'll talk about uh, RNA-targeted therapeutics. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, target, site target Site Therapeutics is our, our new RNA-targeted oligonucleotide therapeutics company spun out of our laboratory at Yale. It is, uh, we're working on, we're developing, I'm sorry, we're developing a first-in-class therapeutic, first-in-class molecular therapeutic with a scientific platform for broad target expansion. We are drugging the undruggable, more on that. And our lead oligo compound is partially de-risks, proven efficacious in vivo MS and psoriasis models. We have preliminary uh, favorable tox profile. And our technology platform uh, is initially focused on autoimmune disorders such as MS, uh, psoriasis, and uveitis. Our, our founding team is myself, with a little bit more gray hair, my colleague, uh, Dinad Ramgalam, Sarin Fidelis, who is a Blavatnik Fellow and is joining uh, Bridget Martel as part of our leadership team. Bridget is our executive chair. We have a very experienced scientific advisory board, both from within and outside of Yale. This discovery came out of our, our studies in leukocyte adhesion, which is a critical early inflammatory event mediated by a class of adhesion receptors called integrins notably alpha-L, beta-2, also known as LFA-1, which, when engaged, drives a gene expression switch that um, involves an RNA binding protein known as HUR. HUR is ubiquitous. It uh, is involved in organ homeostasis. It binds to AU-rich elements and confers RNA protection activity. It can function in an, a microRNA competitive or cooperative fashion, we, we knew uh, immediately that this would not be a safe and specific drug target because of its ubiquitous nature and its role in organ homeostasis. But we found another way, as opposed to the conventional role of microRNAs that uh, lead to gene expression repression, select microRNAs, bind to 3' UTRs, recruit HUR, and this cooperative interaction leads to RNA stabilization and effective translation. 
We reason that blocking this cooperative interaction uh, uh, with sequence-specific modified oligos can greatly and selectively dampen gene expression. Shown here or depicted here is the 3' UTR of the IL-17 messenger RNA, which is very AU-rich. Vinod uh, mapped the binding site for one of these enhancing microRNAs in the 3' UTR. We generated a chemically modified oligo that completely blocks the binding of this microRNA to this uh, 3' UTR specifically. It's very effective at blocking IL-17 production in vitro, as well as uh, effective in blocking disease in vivo. So this is an EAE clinical score. You've heard about EAE already this morning. This is a very, this afternoon, this is a very severe model of multiple sclerosis. The animals that get IP delivery of control oligo all die within three weeks. This is score five is death. But the animals that get our target site block are completely protected from EAE as they are protected against psoriatic plaque formation with topical application in an IL-17 dependent model of psoriasis. Also, not just in prevention, but in treatment. In this EAE experiment, the animals are delivered oligo when they reach a disease score of one. And as opposed to control oligo where the disease progresses, the TSB stabilizes the, the, the disease. The difference between a disease score of two and five is, is huge, and it's more effective than neutralizing antibody to IL-17. So we have a platform screen for additional mirror, uh, mirror y we're calling it mirror y enhancing RNA targets, and a platform screen for other enhancing microRNAs plus their RNA targets. We will uh, develop target site blockers for all of these, and the disease target applications are essentially unlimited at this point. Um, the competitive advantage of TSB approaches are, as compared with anti-mirrors and uh, siRNAs, are really in the area of specificity with limited off-target effects. We've achieved milestones in science, in IP, in incorporation, in tox and PK studies with our uh, collaborators from Genesis. We have a Blavatnik Award and an R21 in neuroinflammation. So in summary, this is a new platform for RNA-targeted therapeutics. It's a first-in-class molecule with specific targeting of an otherwise ubiquitous gene expression switch, drugging the undruggable. We have a platform for broad disease target screens, and our current preclinical development of our lead compound is quite far along. And I think I'll stop there because I have to. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Questions from the judges? Amanda, you're holding the microphone, so. Okay. Do you want to address some um, delivery? Pardon me? Delivery of the oligos. Right. So, so far, we've delivered it uh, through two routes. One is IP, at, at, which leads to very good um, plasma uh, levels within an hour, amazingly. Uh, obviously, that's not going to be uh, useful in humans. So we're looking at sub-Q and IV delivery. The topical delivery, as you saw, is very effective as well. Claire. You went very fast on the competitive landscape. Can you remi um, remind us the, how you differentiate from Emiragen and the other? Uh, simply, um, uh, what, what we're claiming and believe at this point is that this is a very, very specific approach. Uh, and I didn't show you specificity data, but uh, either, even other uh, 3 prime UTRs, messenger RNAs, that have these, the same microRNA binding site, because we target the interaction between the microRNA and the 3 prime UTR specifically, there's no effect on any of the other cytokines with this particular agent. So specificity no off-target effects. Our tox profile initially looks very good. Another question? Quick question from the audience. Right here. Well, that's a good question. Uh, we, uh, at this point, we, we haven't looked specifically at innate immune activation. Our control oligos don't do the same thing, and they have uh, scrambled sequence or similar sequence, but not with specific targeting. So even if we do get, I mean, that, that, there may be an advantage there in some ways, but even if we do get a little bit of innate immune 
uh, targeting, um, they're not, the, uh, the control oligos aren't effective. Great. That's a good question. Jeffrey, thank you very okay. much. Our next speaker for LKIT Therapeutics is Yaha. Well, thank you, Rob. And the, um, um, well, hi, everyone. And I'm here to tell you about LKIT Therapeutics. Um, this is a startup idea based on the development of a new class of lipid kinase inhibitors to selectively, selectively target P53 mutant cancers using synthetic <laughs> lethality. My name is Yaha, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacology. My area of specialty is structural biology and biochemistry. My collaborator, Zhang Elman, sitting in the audience, is Eugene Higgins, professor of chemistry uh, with expertise in organic synthesis and chemical biology. Um, Zhang and I have worked on this project for a number of years, and the, the premise of the project is based on the general observation that p53 mutation gives tumor cells a proliferative advantage, but also renders them susceptible to a variety of metabolic stresses. As you know, p53 mutation is the most common genetic abnormality in human cancer. Within this context, it was discovered that it was discovered that inactivation of two lipid kinases significantly reduces tumorogenesis and cancer-related death in experimental animals. So these two lipid kinases are the alpha and beta isoforms of PI5P4K that were previously known to play a role in cell metabolism. In our laboratories, we discovered that these lipid kinases have overlapping functions with P53, maintaining energy homeostasis during cell cycle progression, therefore simultaneous inactivation of the lipid kinases and P53 would generate a synthetic lethal phenotype in fast proliferating cells. In the competitive field of cancer treatment, we couldn't find any dual inhibitor for PI5P4K alpha and beta. Petra01 shown here at the bottom from Petra Pharma is a lead compound to treat AML. It inhibits only the alpha isoform. If we were successful, LKIT will become the first company to develop a dual PI5P4K inhibitor to selectively attack P53 mutation through synthetic lethality. Using a unique structural-based approach, we have developed highly potent inhibitors which have drug-like heterocycle structures that have a Ki of about 30 nanomolar against both the alpha and beta isoforms of the lipid kinase. Yale University has a file provisional patent for these compounds, and we expect to file additional compositional matters patents as the project progresses. The design, a major challenge of any kinase inhibitor program is how to avoid off-target binding to numerous other protein kinases in the eukaryotic cell. The design of CC260 leveraged our extensive structural insights into the lipid kinase, as shown here, is extremely selective by, the, by profiling against a large panel of protein kinases, as shown here. In cell culture, CC260 disrupts cell energy homeostasis, causes cell cycle arrest, at a G1S checkpoint and suppresses the growth of P53 minus minus kinds of cells. We believe that we are approaching a value inflection point. Um, we are seeking funding to perform proof of concept animal experiments to demonstrate the invivo efficacy of the compound in targeting selectively targeting P53 mutant Cancers accomplishing the goal listed here would position us in a very strong position, will put us in a very strong position to raise Series A fund. venture funding, and the venture goal is to form a company to advance this technology into human trials. In summary, we have developed for the first in class potent selective dual PI5P4K inhibitors with potentially broad applications in cancer treatment. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Zhang or myself or talk to Yale OCR. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, Yahan. Yes, Kate. No, she's okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about have you have you looked at the genetics of tumors? Because you've you've made an assertion about the synthetic lethality. Have you l looked at a wide range of tumors to be absolutely sure that you don't see 
any tumours with um, uh, both of them knocked out? That's a very good question. And the, um, at this moment, all the data, we did search a, a panel of cancer cells that do appear to be a correlation between the P53 status and the degree of growth inhibition. Maybe I didn't adequately address your question because our experience is still limited, but so far everything we looked at seems to be a good correlation. Okay. Paul, anybody, any other judge? And um, since it sounds like the next uh, major step is going into an in vivo model. Um, Correct. Do you feel that the compounds you already have in hand from the pharmacology perspective are ready to go? in terms of anticipated PK and what you'd like to see? That, that is a very good question. The, all the data I showed you here are in vitro, in cell culture dishes, and the, um, the work is in progress to optimize, to improve the PK properties, as you indicated, so we're making progress. We're probably not there yet, but we're making progress toward that goal to be able to administer the compound into the, uh, at least in an intact animal. Thanks, Paul. Another question, a quick question from the audience? If not, then thank you very much, John. Thank you. Our final speaker, uh, Yelp professor, serial entrepreneur, uh, Demetrius Braddock, will talk about uh, his approach to periodontal disease. Okay. So I'm going to call, I'm going to talk to you about the root cause of periodontal disease and our approach to. Um, transform the treatment of patients with this disease. So I'm Demetrius. I have a lab here at Yale, and we study the ENPP enzyme family. Um, I have expertise in ENPP1 enzyme biology, and I was approached about five years by Martha Summerman, who is the institute director at the NIH in the Laboratory of Cranial, Facial, and Dental Research um, on, this on this problem when she saw our papers on another indication, which was an ENPP1 deficient um, <coughs> mouse model in which we, we cured that mouse by a therapy we developed. And that has since resulted in $100 million of venture capital funding from A-list um, investors. Um, and uh, that will be going into clinical trials next year. So I have expertise in, uh, in targeting and understanding disease pathogenesis. I'm a pathologist. I'm also a biochemist. And my, um, I think, specialty is understanding um, what needs to be done and what can be done very quickly and moving that into treatment. So this is one of these indications. So periodontal disease is a little bit unusual for an indication. It's a disease in which your gums recede from your teeth because they become eroded. And what becomes eroded is a substance called cementum, which attaches the periodontal ligament to the tooth. So as that erodes away, you get a pocket, and that pocket gradually expands. And that, once it's gone, it's not coming back. And there are no treatments that will treat that or reverse that. There are only treatments that can slow it but not stop it. So we have an approach that we uh, are going to propose is going to actually reverse that. Now, to get an idea of the <laughs> market size, effectively, periodontal disease is treated in the moderate or severe categories. And that represents a total of 61 million teeth. So this is all done by tooth in the, in the dental uh, business. And evaluating that market is a $5 billion market. So this is a large indication. And it's an unusual indication for um, a, a, a therapeutic, but it's an indication that has significant money being spent in it and that has an opportunity there for those who are willing to take the challenge of, uh, of, of um, innovating into this area. So why do we think we can treat it? Well, I can put up slides to show you why I think I can treat it. But really, what we want to see is a human without this enzyme called ENPP1. And that, uh, that individual is shown here on the left. I don't know if I have a pointer on this or not. Oh, there it is. So this is actually a patient with a disease called generalized arterial calcification of infancy, loss of function mutation in ENPP1. These babies are born, and they will die by two months of age about 60% of the time. If they live, they're going to have lifelong problems that are going to threaten their mortality. But one thing they're not going to have is periodontal disease. Because as you can see, the cementum on this tooth is millimeters thick compared to the wild type. And this reproduces accurately in a mouse model in our laboratory that we've sent to the NIH for analysis. So these are patients analyzed at the NIH, mice in my lab that we've sent to the NIH. <clears throat> now, 
we can, there are known inhibitors which are nanomolar inhibitors to the enzyme that are commercially available, and we have patented the use of these molecules in this indication. We also have expertise in high throughput screening using a synthetic substrate to screen for small molecules in this space, and here's a paper um, demonstrating that technology, uh, which resulted in patents in another indication. So what we'd like to do is um, both use the commercially available molecules and develop our own uh, assets and uh, formulate them identically uh, to what is currently done in the space, which is to put them in microspheres or attach them to nanoparticles. And once we do that, we will simply treat the animal model of this disease, which is an animal model that was developed in Dr. Summerman's lab at the NIH, in which you kind of uh, erode the, uh, the cementum and then you watch it regenerate. And here's a wild type animal with that procedure done and this thin blue line here is the cementum regeneration. And here's an animal model that's deficient in pyrophosphate, the enzymatic product of ENPP1, in which that has come back. So. Um, Essentially, what I've just shown you is proof of concept in a human, an animal model that directly translates to that human, and available chemical space in that area that we've patented that we can immediately use to formulate and um, essentially execute in an animal model that will give us proof of concept for a $5 billion indication. So that's my idea, and um, these are all the people that have worked so hard over the past years, both in this indication and in this other indication of a lethal disease. Um, and thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Demetrius. Amanda. Hi, Demetrius. Can you comment on your clinical development strategy? Um, so the, the clinical development strategy would parallel the clinical development strategy for a molecule called Arrestin, which is effectively tetracycline that's been formulated identically. So there's a, a path that's been followed, and we would essentially follow that path. The, um, the, uh, clin the clinical trial would involve measuring the depth of this pocket before and after treatment over time. And um, that uh, for Arrestin, that was a nine-month trial uh, involving about 200 patients, and we have all that information. So we've, we've kind of mapped out how we would go about running the clinical trial and what those costs would be. Um, they would be much less than, you know, cancer indications in these things. So you're talking about a $5 million, basically, clinical trial to get into an FDA approval in this, uh, in this indication. Other questions? So currently, um, Arrestin is priced at like $87 a tooth, and it does nothing effectively. So um, that would be the floor. And you know, if you can um, basically reverse that, where you'd move the patient from, let's say, moderate to benign, uh, mild disease or severe to moderate, you, know, you could think about multiples of that indication. So the $5 billion estimate I gave you was an estimate based on an $87 pricing. So I, I think that's a very conservative estimate, and that's a conservative number of teeth. Um, there. Just a curious question. Yeah, sure. Tooth whiteners affect? <laughs> no, they don't. So tooth whiteners affect something called dentin, which is um, a different substance on your tooth. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Last question? Paul? Cool. Sure. Um, could, uh, assuming, you know, safety and all those types of things, sure. um, could you see this as being a prophylactic treatment for periodontal disease? Well, y yeah. We, I mean, uh, certainly. The current therapy is, is sort of prophylactic in the sense that it's not really reversal. We, we're really hoping that this will reverse the disease. I mean, from what we've seen with the animal, from what we've seen with these patients with this terrible disease, there's no question that suppressing this enzyme makes your cementum expand. So um, we're thinking like a, a episodic treatment over a short period of time, a removal of that inhibitor, you know, allowing that cementum to robustly regenerate and then adapt to the new um, microenvironment will probably uh, be a very effective therapy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Thanks. So I want, before Bill comes up, I want to thank our panel of judges, uh, Tim, Cindy, Ben, Amanda, Paul, Kate, and Claire. Um, I think Bill, uh, they get a 10% discount on first investment in these companies. Um, so I think that's, that's the building. That's Back up and you're going to let people know what's next. Let's thank all of our contestants.
And we have one last chance to enjoy the sunshine outside and uh, network, uh, meet the companies that you saw just present. Uh, we've been doing this for a few years and many of them turn into real companies that are hiring people and uh, raising money from investors, so do some networking. Um, when, we, uh, when we resume in 26 minutes, there's a choice of three things. There's a biotech panel in this room. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, uh, a med tech panel upstairs in room 2400. And, um, do, no, that's, I am incorrect. Am I incorrect? Where's my, no, that's right. And I believe we do have some more Connecticut innovation companies upstairs. Yes, so the, the Connecticut innovation companies upstairs are tech companies, and that is um, Cadenza Innovation, Shelf, Payveris, and R4.